Hello my dear friends, I welcome you all to my channel Best Notes Tutorials and today we are going to learn entire details about Nathaniel Hawthorne. He was an American writer and he became extremely popular not only in America but throughout the world because of his very important work Scarlet Letter. In this work, he talks about adultery and the circumstances which led a woman to adopt this evil. So, today we are going to learn about Scarlet Letter along with other important works of Nathaniel. So, let's begin. Nathaniel was born on 4th July 1804 in Salem, Massachusetts. His parents were Nathaniel Hathron and the former Elizabeth Clark Manning. His ancestors include John Hawthorne, the only judge from the Salem Witch Trials. He entered Bowdoin College in 1821 and he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa in 1824. He graduated in 1825. He published his first book, first work in 1828, the novel Fan Shaw. And uh, students at that time, he did not write his name. This was published anonymously. Okay? He later tried to suppress it, feeling that it was not equal to the standard of his later work. After writing this and publishing, he realized that other works are of very standard one and not this one. Therefore, he wanted to erase it. But he left it because of some reason. He published several, several short stories in periodicals which he collected in 1837 as Twice Told Tales. Okay, Twice Told Tales. Please remember this. It was published as periodicals first and then it was published in one book as well and the name was twice told tales this has come in one of the question so please keep in mind the next year he became engaged to sophia peabody he worked as the boston custom house and joined brook farm a transgenderist community transcendentalist community before marrying Peabody in 1842. The couple moved to the old man's in Concord, Massachusetts, later moving to Salim, the Berkshires, then to the wayside in Concord. So, Nathaniel's life was bid in transit from here to there, but it did not stop him from writing creative books. Scar the Scarlet Letter was published in 1850, followed by a succession of other novels. And this Scarlet Letter had become very popular. Scarlet means red, okay, blood red and letter A. Okay, in the story we find the story of letter A, which means adultery. So this will also be asked in examination, which is the word referred to as the scarlet letter then you have to mention it is a and the scarlet means i told you it is red okay so a which was written in red color is referred in that book a political appointment and council took hawthorne and family to europe before their return to concord in 1860. hawthorne died on may 19 1864 and was survived by his wife and their three children. Much of Hawthorne's writing centers on New England. The maximum work features moral metaphors with an anti-Puritan inspiration. Here, friends, you need to remember that he talks about morality at extent. 
he talks about love also but at the end the love will be linked with morality okay how that we will learn in the discussion of all the works all the important works his fiction works are considered part of the romantic movement and more specifically dark romanticism here as i told you he talks about he writes stories novels about uh, romantics okay romantic things but it specifies dark romanticism love is there but loves darker side okay which is not pleasing which is not enjoyable which is not you know something which gives us happiness all right and it is said that too much of anything is very bad isn't it so in the same way too much of love is also bad too much of possession is also bad so in his work we get to see possession okay it highlights possession excessive possession of human being he died on may 19th 1864 at the age 59 at plymouth new hampshire hampshire united states let's see the quote of nathaniel hawthorne our most initiate friend is not he who not he to whom we should we show the worst but the best of our nature you might get it in question that who whose words are these so at that time you have to write it is nathaniel hawthorne who is an american english writer let's talk about his uh, work details he first anonymously published short stories and novel fanshaw this was his first work which he published without any name hawthorne later formally withdrew most of his early work discounting it as the work of inexperienced youth later on when he kept on writing his writing capability writing creativity was not um similar to the initial works therefore initial works he wanted to take back for that he burned most of his works from these years he was the editor for the american magazine of useful and entertaining knowledge in 1836 he received appointment to the boston custom house in 1839 and he was engaged to sophia peabody and got married in 1842 during his last stage of life he returned to us from europe in 1860 he became so ill and underwent a loss of literary creativity journeyed to the white mountains hoping to restore his health and he died in plymouth shire on may 19 1864 He was buried in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord. From here, you might get a question that whose cemetery is there in Sleepy Hollow? So at that time, you have to write it is none other than Nathaniel Hawthorne's. Friends, in this video, we are going to include these ten works of Nathaniel, the birthmark. which was published in the year 1843 the great stone face in the year 1850 the house of the seven gables 1851 the blithdell romance in the year 1852 the marvel fawn in 1860 tanglewood tales with some summaries of its stories in which was published in the year 1921 the ocean was published in 1825 oh could i raise the dark darkened veil which is published in 1820 twice told tales which is published in the year 1842 and the very important the scarlet letter in 1850 we are going to discuss every work which are mentioned out here in details so please be careful let's take up the first work that is the birth mark The birthmark was first published in the Pioneer in March 
1843, it represents a particularly effective and sustained consideration of precisely these aesthetic issues and other of more cultural import. The tale examines obsession with human perfections. Here, students, your friends, it was published in 1843 and it represents effective sustained consideration of precisely these aesthetic. Okay, here, aesthetic issues are concerned, okay, and it has, uh, you know, and other more cultural imports. Okay, the things which are related to human culture. Okay, human culture are highlighted in the story birthmark. It examines obsession of human being. Some of the human beings are obsessed, obsessed with, you know, some of the things like, uh, say for example, the way of doing things. Okay, some mark, the kind of house they want. Alright, so those positions, okay, excessive positions for perfection are mentioned here. And here it is birthmark. Whose was it and what he wanted it to be done, we will learn. Hawthorne's works along belong to Romanticism, more specifically dark Romanticism. As we have already told you, it projects the negative side of excessive love. It projects cautionary tales that suggest that guilt, sin, evil and evil are the most inherent natural qualities of humanity. Here, all these qualities of human being are highlighted. Okay. And it is exaggerated. It is exaggerated and it surfaces because of human qualities. Many of these tales and novels focus on a type of historical fiction. Some of the stories are related with historical events. Therefore, it, uh, it is historical fiction. Though Hawthorne's depiction of the past is used only as a vehicle to express themes of ancestral sin, guilt and retributions. Here, at presently, the things which, are, which we are being explained by the writer. Okay, it has some link with history, but that is to depict okay depict the things which had happened in past and how it can be related to the present most of the things are related to ancestral sin ancestral guilt and ancestral retributions okay this theme of the story is man versus nature what man has made will not last and what nature or god has given can never be destroyed Okay, it says, it, there is a saying that man proposes, God disposes. It is because God has much more wider plans for human being than man's desires. Okay, so here it is a battle between, it is a cold war between man and nature. Okay, how it is highlighted, let's find out. And these are effectively shown in these two lines. Okay. These lines are from the story, the birthmark. Let's read out what is that line. Man would accent from one step to powerful intelligence to another until the philosopher should lay his hands on the secret of creative force and perhaps make new worlds for himself. Here, man they have they have developed and they are developing but it is not able to reach to that aesthetic place okay where their desire will stop if they have something they will desire for something else okay therefore there is no end of desire and it is man made man is trying to obtain god like powers in their Search for power over nature. This is very much true. Scientists are working day and night. Isn't it? Scientists are working day and night to understand how God has created things. Okay, how God has planned these processes. How God has given power to nature. Okay, and after knowing that secret, right, human beings are trying to dominate the nature. Okay, and through this story, we get to understand that this is something which is, you know, where human beings are going wrong. 
right we should not try to overpower nature otherwise the things will be hazardous that is the message from the story humans accept sorry human attempt to obtain power over god can never be achieved here this human being cannot ever destroy god okay humans are inherently imperfect but this imperfection is what makes us perfect here what we need to understand out here is that human beings okay or we people are humans because we are imperfect if we will be perfect then we will not be human being we will be god okay therefore if we take away all the imperfections from us okay all the imperfections from human beings then human being will lose its identity okay you must have heard the proverb to err is human and to forgive is divine all right so it shows that human being are born to make mistake okay they are born to make mistake they are born imperfect throughout the life there will be something or other which he can he or she cannot perfect all right but it is not with the case for case of god god has plans even if he will mistake he will mistake for you know fixing something which was which was over damaged all right so here we need to understand that ultimate sacrifice out of love here we need to understand that love is the another name of sacrifice okay there should be ultimate sacrifice in love otherwise it will not last we need to accept imperfections of our count, our of our partners our flaws which are what makes us perfect are what align us with god see if we have everything then we will not be aligned towards god okay we will not ask him to give us the things which we desire okay we are imperfect we want something that is why we are asking we are uh, you know bowing our head down to god if we will have everything then we are not going to do the same therefore it is required and this is highlighted in these lines from this story the fatal hands had grappled with the mystery of life and was the bond by which an angelic spirit kept itself in union with a mortal frame here the wrong doings that we did throughout our life that is full of mystery why it happened how it happened all right we did good things but why you know opposite things happened all these are being calculated and these are being worked in union holistically we are being observed by god okay therefore we cannot say that god's calculation is wrong okay now we will move towards the character sketch of this work here we find elmo elmo is a man of science who lived in the latter part of 18th century since hawthorne wrote the story in 1843 the setting makes a piece of historical fiction the characters are fascinated towards science and development and technological inventions were influenced by their own values assumption anxieties and politics a problem that also plagues alzima in the story see uh, friends in the 1843 around 1843 okay you can say mid 19th century people were so much you know diverted towards science and development scientific development technological invention and the scientific development they wanted to achieve everything through science everything they wanted to go against nature as well okay so they are in utter anxiety they are worried very much they have problem with their own values okay and apart from that there is a problem in the story to this scientist what was that let's find out another character in the story is georgiana and georgiana is wife of alma she is so beautiful because of which the scientist was attracted the only flaw on her beauty was the birthmark that she possessed on her face 
there is a mark okay there is a mark on georgiana's face and because of which her beauty is you know blotted and her husband wanted to take that off so what happens later let's see she is very calm and composed lady who believed in god she is very much calm and composed okay she she does not want to lead a life of hustle and bustle okay she is she ex- whatever she comes to us whatever comes to georgiana she accepts it and moves ahead with optimism the story starts off with a man named almo that is a scientist and natural philosopher he marries a woman named georgiana almo's wife is beautiful but there is a mark birthmark on her cheek that is of a that is the shape of a hand friends please keep in mind that in the examination you might be asked what was the shape of the birthmark of the protagonist in the story birthmark you have to write it is in the shape of a hand okay hand his attention was so much distracted by the mark one day he asks her if she would like to have it removed georgiana was astonished by her husband's question here husband almo wanted to give georgiana flawless flawless beauty okay but he failed in that he wanted to do it because he felt that this is something which is blotting the beauty of his wife and he was distracted so much okay he was distracted so much because of which he was so much disturbed by this some considered it to be a charm and even admired it admired it almo starts to become too much obsessed with the birthmark one night he has a dream about it that he was cutting it to his wife skin cutting into his wife's skin he continued it and kept cutting so deep that he cut her heart out georgiana assesses almer's obsession and finally she says that she is willing to risk her life to remove it here friends in the story almer alma heard that some of the people admired that mark on georgiana's face but some um, did not like alma okay alma was so much obsessed with this birthmark that he wanted it to be removed so it came in his because of over possession it came in his dream as well he saw that he was removing his wife's birthmark from the skin okay from the face and he cut he happened to cut her heart out as well okay he saw this in dream that he was removing the mark of his wife and suddenly he cut the heart of his wife as well okay georgiana understood that he is extremely possessed by this and his he is so much disturbed he is not able to concentrate in his work because of this mark therefore for the happiness of husband she agrees but she knows that this is going to be fatal for her okay it is going to be dangerous for her therefore she risked she risked her life in order to give peace and calmness to her husband let's move towards the story they decided to remove the birthmark in almer's laboratory in the laboratory almo leaves georgiana for a couple of hours there she finds his journals and reads about her own experiment and starts to cry almo brings her the potion and shows her how it works on a flower taking away any blot this on it here georgiana georgiana understood understood that the experience the experiment is going to be very dangerous for her okay because after that surgery he will be challenging the almighty so she understood the result but she could not stop him okay on the top of that almo brought a potion a liquid okay which 
he brought for demonstration he he saw okay he showed how it works on a flower to remove the blot he showed it to georgiana after georgiana thinks the potion after georgiana drinks the potion she falls asleep while she was unconscious almo studies everything about her georgiana wakes up from a sleep only to tell almo that she is dying that you have rejected the best that earth could offer here the operation takes place okay georgiana was given a potion she becomes unconscious and almo performs operation for that mark but unfortunately georgiana georgiana's operation was not successful okay and she was about to die but she wanted to tell almo that she is dying because he did not accept nature in its own way okay in its true way therefore she is dying because anything that god has given can never be wrong it can never be ugly therefore therefore almo was shocked to listen these words from georgiana this was this assures that human being cannot challenge almighty let's move to another story the great stone face Let's see the publication date and details. Hawthorne likely began writing the Great Stone Face while living at while living at fourteen Mall Street in his native town of Salem. It was first published on January twenty fourth, eighteen fifty, in the National Era. The Great Stone Face is a short story published by Nathaniel Hawthorne in Hawthorne in 1850. The story reappears in the full length in book. Hawthorne sets the scene in rural village uh, sorry valley located in an unnamed US state that resembles New Hampshire. A rock formation in a nearly notch is imagined. Notch is mountaineers trenches okay or valley by many local locals and visitors to resemble the shape and features of a human face so this work talks about some image okay which was seen on this stone all right human face seen on this stone how it happens how it appears and uh, what is the story behind it let's find out here character sketch we will go through character sketch and here we find ernest he is upright hard working and benevolent presence to his neighbors he spends his leisure hours gazing at a mountain rock formation called the great stone face next character is ernest's mother loving woman who tells her son about an old story predicting that a child born in the valley below the great stone face will become the greatest person of his time the story says his face will resemble one on the mountain next character is mr gathergold a wealthy merchant who is a native of the valley he arrives in the valley during his end days another important character is old blood and thunder great general who is a native of the valley returned in valley after becoming old and retired next is statesman great orator who is a native of the valley another character is poet great writer who is a native of the valley who declared that ernest it should be capital okay ernest resembles as great stone face this is very interesting stories friends please be attentive let's start the story one afternoon a mother with her son 
Ernest was at the door of their cottage. They were talking about the great stone face. It was clearly visible in the bright sunshine. Thousands of people lived there. Everybody there was familiar with the great stone face. It was the work of the nature. Friends, here we find a mother who was with her son, Ernest. Okay, and everybody in that area was talking about the the face, okay, which was which has emerged in this stone, okay, and it was natural work. Nobody had sculptured it, okay, and somebody told, according to the you know folklore, it was believed that the person whose face is resembled in that particular valley so you know mountainous valley they that particular person is going to be very great the person's face who with whom the stone face matches that person is going to be very great okay and everyone had tried but it did not match anyone's so let's see whether there is anyone with whom the stone face is going to be resembled one day the great stone face smiled on Ernest and looked kindly. He wished to hear its pleasant voice. He longed to see a man with such a face in order to love him dearly. There was a man called Gather Gold. He Gather Gold. He had left his native many years ago. He had become quite rich man there. He decided to return to his native valley. The great stone face seemed to reject gather gold. Here, friends, the great stone face, okay, here we see personification, okay, personification means uh, the character of a human being is given to inanimate object. So, here, stone, okay, stone is something which is natural thing, okay, so it cannot speak, right. But here it is smiled on Ernest, little boy Ernest, and therefore we find personification here. Now, what happens? He smiles, okay, on Ernest. It seems that Ernest's face matches with that great stone face. And this uh, stone face uh, was so happy that he wanted to listen to the voice of this little boy. And he was very, uh, he longed to see a man with such a face in order to love him dearly. So here, you know, great stone face had been longing since ages to see somebody with whom his face matches. Right? <clears throat> there was another man as well, gather gold. But this stone face did not approve of his arrival because he did not like gather gold. He rejects being similar to this gather gold okay one day the great stone face smiled there was a rumor that gather gold looked like great stone face gather gold had the face of an old man with a yellow skin the people considered him the image of great stone face Ernest gazed up the valley. The great stone face seemed to reject gather gold as its likeness. Here, friends, listen, listening to the rumor, gather gold went to that place where the face had been, had emerged, okay? And by resemblance, he was not at all like that stone face. People had just spread the strife okay strife rife or rumor here stone face did not approve that this gather gold was similar to him Ernest lived in his native valley he was a simple hearted man he always worked for the betterment of the world though he was considered to be an ordinary man yet he was humble and rich in thoughts with the passage of time, Ernest became old. He had wise thoughts in his mind. Here, the main protagonist is Ernest. 
okay he was a very good person he was very honest and kind hearted man kind hearted man who always worked for betterment of the world even though he was not much uh, rich by his physical possession he was very much rich by his mindset okay he had lots of thoughts in it he used to think about the world what is right what is wrong how the world can be improved okay how you know with his contribution how he can make it a better place to live in all right he had become famous all over the world man men came from distant places to see and speak to him a new poet had appeared on earth while ernest had been growing old the poet was a native of ernest's valley but had stayed in distant cities for a long period the poet had heard of ernest's character here we find arrival of the poet okay because ernest had become very famous throughout the world and it is because of his behavior and nature here we find the arrival of a new poet and here new poet it wants to suggest that ernest was growing old okay new people were coming in that uh, valley but there are people who are growing old let's see when he grows old whether his face will look like that stone face wall or not one day he came to his door ernest was reading a book and glancing lovingly at the mountain from time to time ernest gave him shelter for the night the great stone face looked kindly at the poet the poet found ernest wise gentle and kind here poet arrived to ernest's house one day and ernest was reading a book okay this this is what made him wise all right and he was loving looking at the mountain time to time because that was the chief you know thing which attracted everyone to that valley ernest gave him shelter and shelter for the night ernest gave shelter to this poet okay poet for one night and uh, poet found ernest wise gentle and kind okay because this man was unknown to him even then he provided shelter to this man that is the poet friends here we find the poet okay who was new to that valley he had already observed that so many people had come to check whether their face resembles the stone's face or not okay according to the prophecy the person whose face will be similar to the great stone he will be great person wise intelligent and he will be respected by everyone so the people who returned after being being retired like army person okay businessmen and other uh, reputed people had come back okay who were very rich all right but they did not match the stone face finally it was the poet who took ernest to the great wall by this time he had become a preacher ernest had become a preacher okay he had become a preacher and his scheduled preaching uh, was very soon for that poet requested him to uh, you know preach his uh, sermon from that great wall face so when he was about to deliver the poet says behold behold ernest behold and then he asks everybody to match the face of ernest and the face of the great uh, wall all right stone face then they shouted that it is same it is same especially poet shouts that it is same okay the wise and intelligent man okay who fulfills the prophecy is none other than ernest but ernest did not pay heed to it okay he just smiled and holding the hand of the poet he walks away from there saying that i am not 
somebody else would come and bear the resemblance to the great stone face so it shows that even if you have caliber even if you have knowledge and wisdom and you are not using it for the mankind it is useless the thing which happened with other renowned and retired people they had knowledge okay but they did not utilize it for the upliftment of society whereas ernest being there he upgraded himself and in his last days as well he tried to preach so that some of the people will change their life so therefore ernest is the hero of the story let's move ahead to another one now we will do the house of the seven gables the author is nathaniel hawthorne the author is nathaniel hawthorne and the country is united states in english and it is gothic fiction okay it is related to ghosts publisher is tignor and fils and publication date is march 1851 introduction of the work the house of the seven gables is a gothic novel this is the work of american writer nathaniel hawthorne friends you will be asked what journal holds the novel the house of the seven gables you have to write it is gothic novel it belongs to gothic journal this was published in april 1851 by Tignor and Fils of Boston the novel follows a new england family and their ancestral home okay for father's home in the book hawthorne explores themes of guilt retribution and atonement and colors the tale with suggestions of the supernatural and witchcraft here friends we we got we get to see that even if we are full of guilty we should be able to rectify those mistakes we need atonement okay we need to uh, try to overcome the flaws that we did in our past days so this is gothic novel which takes us to supernatural power and witchcraft etc the characters in the story are hebziba pinchon holgrave pob pichon alice pichon Colonel Pichon, George Jeffrey Pichon, Matthew Mole, Clifton Pichon, Uncle Venner, and Ned Higgins. These are important characters in the story. Friends, please keep in mind that in the examination you might be asked that so and so character is from which work of Nathaniel Hawthorne. You should be ready with with this. Okay, keep in mind this Pichon. usually will you'll see the surname and you should uh, in your mind it should strike that it is from the gothic novel okay so let's start it's from the gothic novel the house of the seven gables in the house of the seven gables nathaniel hawthorne tells us the story of a family the family fortunes are poisoned by its past wrongdoings the sin of the forefathers are visited upon the children over a period of several generations until one of the descendants unites with a member of the family he was wronged he has wronged here we find that the ancestors had done some wrongdoings okay wrong things because of which that entire family was poisoned entire family was cursed okay so whoever were the descendants whoever were the new generations of that particular family they could not live peacefully okay so what was the wrong doing and how did were the upcoming generations were at trouble let's find out this particularly talks about love conquers hate and new blood washes away the original sin here love conquers because of love okay the hatred that these uh, ghosts had for this 
new descendants okay it was washed away right new blood versus that means new generation versus the original scene original scene means which is done by ancestors okay hawthorne thus explores guilt okay guilty of wrongdoings revenge revenge by revenge by the person who had experienced the injustice and atonement in this novel atonement means the uh, rectification okay the fulfill sorry he fulfills his motive through the lives of the pichon family in their gloomy bleak seven gabled new england mansion so this is the place where the ghosts used to stay and they troubled pichon family members especially new generation as the author as the author notes in a short preface to the novel a romance as the author notes in this short preface to the novel a romance see because love is also included here therefore it to some extent it can be co called uh, you can say some love elements are also there okay it cannot totally be called as a romance the story thus as hawthorne states includes fantastical occurrences in probabilities and attempts to connect the past with the present sacrificing literal authenticity for more abstract truths here the story is very interesting because of the things that happens okay fantastical occurrences okay Fant uh, fantasies that we see here probabilities that we see here and attempts to connect past with present okay the things that were already done in past needed to be implemented at present as well in order to get a holistic view of the story so here with the help of new generation they were able to get rid of the sin that was done by, done to the new uh, done to this pichon family friends this work we will uh, work it on individually to length because right now it is not possible to include all the details therefore i will make a detailed story about it very soon let's move to the bithdel romance now it is written by nathaniel hawthorne and uh, it was published by tinknor fields again it was published in the year 1852 the bithdel romance was published in 1852 is nathaniel hawthorne's third major romance its setting is a utopian farming commune based on brook farm of which hawthorne was a founding member and where he lived in 1841 here friends if you notice that nathaniel wherever he went he took the place as the setting for his novel so here also the same thing it's seen that ideal farming commune okay utopian or ideal farming commune is the setting out here the characters are miles coverdale old modi the wheeled lady hollingsworth silas foster genobia priscilla and professor westernwelt the lithdel romance is nathaniel's third major romance friends the novel dramatizes the conflict between commune's ideals and the members private desire and romantic rivalries the hot sorry in hawthorne henry james called it the lightest and the brightest and liveliest of hawthorne's unhumorous fictions while literary critic richard broadhead has described it as the dark darkest of hawthorne's novel his next work is the marvel fawn and this was published in the year 
by the same publisher that is Ticknor and Fields. It belongs to Gothic fiction. The characters are Miriam, Hilda, Kenyon and Donatello. Marion is a beautiful painter with an unknown past. Throughout the novel, she is compared to many other women. Kenyon is a sculptor who represents rationalist humanism. He cherishes a romantic affection towards Hilda. It is the last novel by Nathaniel Hawthorne. It paints a surreal picture of guilt love and responsibility when describing the adventures of three Americans and one Italian in the eternal city of Rome. Here students it might be asked that where did we find the characters of Nathaniel Hawthorne's work. The Marble Fawn at that time you have to write it is Rome okay it is Rome the book starts by introducing the characters the first is Kenyon an American sculptor who comes to Rome to study the ancients in his footsteps are Hilda and Miriam two art students with different backgrounds finally the Italian Count Donatello a friend of the group is introduced here friends this is related to artwork and here we find different characters who were enchanted by the history of Rome therefore most of the people like Hilda Miriam and uh, Kenyon moved towards Rome okay Hawthorne's story takes many detours describing in details ancient art and the beauty of the city friends through that through this work we get to see ancient art of rome and the beauty of the city the culture that it preserved till now okay it beautifies its city even after many years mariam the passionate and exotic woman from new england has a chance encounter with a stranger in the catacomb you must have seen catacombs okay it is graveyard you can say multiple graveyard okay where there is no window where th there is no um, way to enter the light here catacombs are made to bury live bury people in the mid centuries here during a night time excursion to the Capitoline Hill, the stranger approaches her. Donatello, madly obsessed with Mariam, by this point cannot take this and murders the man in cold blood. Here, Donatello becomes a murderer because of his obsession towards Mariam. The innocent Hilda has witnessed the act and is crushed by the secret. In her desperation, she decided to confess to the Catholic Church. The book ends when Donatello can finally no longer take his guilt and gives himself up to justice. Hilda, deeply affected by what he has seen, agrees to marry Kenyon, Mariam, Kenyon and Mariam, the only truly the one truly affected becomes deeply depressed and disappears. Here friends, finally Donatello, who was the culprit in the story, okay, he surrenders to justice and he was able to find peace in surrendering. All right, whereas Hilda, he, she wanted to confess in Catholic Church and Mariam, was extremely affected by this incident therefore she became dis depressed and after that she disappeared let's move to another work that is tanglewood tanglewood tales 
Tanglewood Tales was published in published in 1921 and it is illustrated by Virginia Frances Starlet. Tanglewood Tales for Boys and Girls was published in 1853 and it is a book by American author Nathaniel Hawthorne a sequel to A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. It is a rewriting of well-known Greek myth in a volume of children. Volume for children. Let's move ahead, friends. Here. Here we find in Tanglewood Tales these many stories. The book includes the myths of Theus, Thesis and the Minotaur in the chapter The Minotaur. Antius and the Pygmies in the chapter The Pygmies. Dragon's Teeth in the chapter The Dragon's Teeth. Cirque's Palace in the chapter Cirque's Palace. Proserpina, Ceres, Pluto and the Promegranate Seed. In the chapter The Promognate Seed, Jason and the Golden Fleece. In the chapter The Golden Fleece. So, all these stories we are going to discuss to you all. Hathrun wrote an introduction titled The Wayside, referring to the Wayside in Concord. There he lived for from 1852 until his death. In the introduction, Hawthorne writes about a visit from his young friend Ostace Bright who requested a sequel to a wonder book which impelled him to write the tales. Friends, you have to keep in mind because sometimes the background of the story will also be asked. Okay. Although Hawthorne informs us in the introduction that these stories were also later Retold by cousin Austin, the frame stories of a wonder book have been abandoned. Hawthorne writes the first book while renting a small cottage in Berkshire's a vacation areas for industrialists during the Gilded Age. The owner of the cottage, a road a railroad baron, renamed the cottage. Tanglewood in honor of the book written there. Here please keep in mind this thing also that why the name of the cottage was Tanglewood. You have to write the writer wrote the book in that particular cottage therefore from a railroad baron it has become Tanglewood. Later, a nearby mansion was renamed Tanglewood where outdoor classical concerts were held, which became a Berkshire summer tradition. Ironically, Hawthorne hated living in the Berkshires. The Tanglewood neighborhood of Houston was named after the book. The book was a favorite of Mary Catherine Farrington, the daughter of Tanglewood developer William Farrington. It reportedly inspired the name of the thickly wooded Tanglewood Island in the state of Washington. Let's start with the summary of Thesis. Thesis was the mythical king and founder hero of Athens, like Perseus. Cadmus and Heracles, Thesis battled and overcame foes that were identified with an archaic religious and social order. Here, friends, in Thesis we find there is a mythical king whose name is, he was the founder of Athens. Okay, like these heroes, Perseus, Cadmus, Heracles, Thesis also battled, he also fought for the identity of their community. His role in history has been called a major cultural transition like the making of the new Olympia by Hercule, Hercules. Here 
he was about to write a history for himself. Okay, just like Hercules. Theseus was a foundling hero of the Athenians in the same way the Heracles was the foundling hero of the Dorians. The Athenians agreed Theseus was a great reformer. His name comes from the same root as Thymos meaning rule or precept. The myth surrounding Theseus, his journeys, exploits and friends have provoked material for fiction throughout the ages. Theseus was responsible for the Sinoikismos or dwelling together. The political unification of Attica under Athens represented emblematically in his journey of labor, subduing ogres and monsters beasts. Theseus was uh, able to unify his entire community against monsters and ogres. Okay, ogres are also monsters only. Because he was the unifying because he was the unifying king, Theseus built and occupied a palace on the fortress of the Acropolis that may have been similar to the palace that was excavated in Mycenae. Pausanias report that after the Sinoikismos, Theseus established a cult of Aphrodite Pandemos, Aphrodite of all the people and Petho on the southern slope of the Acropolis. Plutarch's Life of Theseus, a literalistic biography, makes use of varying accounts of death of the Minotaur, Theseus' escape and the love of Adrian of a thesis. Plutarch's source, not all of those texts have survived independently, including Predensides, mid 5th century BCE, Demon, century 4000 BCE, Philochorus, and Cladmus. Both 4th century BCE, as the, pro, as the subject of myth, the existence of Theseus as a real person has not been proven, but scholars believe that he may have been alive during the late Bronze Age, possibly as a king in the 8th or 9th century or BCE. Now we will move to another story, Antasios. Antasios, it means opponent. Okay, derived from Greek word antau. I face, I oppose. Known to the barbers and anti was a figure in Barbo and Greek mythology. In Greek sources, he was the giant son of Postan and Gaia who lived in the interior desert of Libya. His wife was the goddess Tinge for whom the city of Tangier in Monaco was named. And he had a daughter named Alcis or Bars. He was famed for his loss to Heracles as part of the twelve, twelve labors. Here, the myth was, Antaeus would challenge all passerby by wrestling matches and remained invincible as long as he remained in contact with his mother, the earth. As Greek wrestling, like its modern equivalent, typically attempted to force opponents to the ground, as always won, he always won, killing his opponent. He built a temple to his father using their skulls. Antigius Antigius fought Heracles, as he was on his way to the garden of Hesperides, Hesperides, as his eleventh labor, Heracles realized that he could not beat Antaeus by throwing or pinning him. Instead, he held him aloft and then crushed him 
to death in a beer hug. The contest between Horacles and Antonio was a favored subject in ancient and Renaissance sculpture. Let's move to another story from Tanglewood Tales that is the dragon's teeth. In Greek mythology, Cadmus was the founder and first king of Thebes. Cadmus was the first Greek hero and alongside Perseus and Bellerophon, the greatest hero and slavers of monsters before the days of Heracles. Commonly stated to be a Phoenician prince, son of King Egno and Queen Telephasa of Tyre and the brother of Phoenix, Calix and Europha. He was originally sent by his royal parent to seek out an escort to sister Europa, pack of Tyre after she was abducted from the shores of Phoenicia by Jews. In early accounts, Cadmus and Europa were instead the children of Phoenix. Cadmus founded the Greek city of Thebes, the Acropolis of which was originally named Cadmia in his honor. Cadmus' homeland was the subject of significant disagreement along among ancient authors. Apollodorus identifies it as Phoenician, but Tyre, Sidon, and even Thebes in Egypt are refer referenced in different accounts. His parentage is sometimes modified to suit example claims of Theban origin, name his mother as name of the daughters Nilus, one of the Potamoi and deity of the Nile River, Nile River. Cadmus was credited by the ancient Greeks, such as Herodotus, in the year four eight four and four two five BC, one of the first Greek historians, but one who also wove standard myths and legends through his work with introducing the original Phoenician alphabet to the Greeks who adapted it to form their Greek alphabet. Herodotus estimated that Cadmus lived 1600 years before his time which would be around 2000 BC. Herodotus had been had seen and described the Cadmine writing in the temple of Apollo at Thebes engraved on certain tripods. Let's move towards the ocean. The Ocean by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Ocean published in 1825 by Nathaniel Hawthorne is made up of four quatrains or four four line stanzas. The poem has a very simple rhyme scheme following the pattern of A B A B C D C D throughout the entire piece. This gentle repetition of end rhymes carries the speaker from the beginning of the poem to the end without hesitation. The Ocean by Nathaniel Hothro is a short sanguine poem about peace that lost sailor that lost sailors find after death. In the depth of the ocean. The poem begins by describing the ocean as having different sections. The ocean has different sections. The deep and lonely recesses such as silent, silent caves, the furious waves on the surface and the peaceful ocean floor. In the lonely parts of the ocean, demons commune with one another, but below them, where no one can treat, are the young, the bright, the fair and 
fare the men that have been lost to the waters. They rest there calmly in a world that is the equal that that is the equal of heaven. Hawthorne's speaker finishes the poem by elaborating on the idea that the earth and ocean have feelings. These emotions are based off of those felt by those that inhabit the planet and have allowed the earth to create places of happiness to rival those of despair. Hawthorne begins this piece by introducing the poem, poem's main character, the ocean. It is clear from this first two words of the first verse that the ocean is going to be treated with reverence or respect. It is going to be considered more than just a body of water. The capitalization, the capitalization of ocean makes this apparent as no other words in the poem are unnecessarily capitalized. The ocean is said to have silent caves that are deep under water quite alone. The parts of section the parts and section of the ocean are going to be consistently personified in this piece with the water being given the power of determination and almost a conscience. Here, personification, we have already read that it is it means attributing human qualities to an inanimate object. So here, inanimate object is ocean and ocean is being given is being given is being given power just like a human being just like a human being therefore we need to check it out through that perspective okay the second half of the stanza paints the image of ocean that Hawthorne will advance on the surface it is filled with fury and passion but beneath the waves all is calm and serene the lines are, few lines I have included here. Let's find out. Let's see. The earth has guilt. The earth has care. Un, unquiet are its graves. But peaceful sleep is ever there beneath the dark blue waves. The poem concludes with a four line and final quatrain in which Hawthorne speaks, speaker makes Strikingly clear the idea that the earth and ocean experience emotions as humans do. The earth, his speaker says, has guilt, has care. It is able to, through the presence and actions of human beings, understand and interpret far and peace. Interpret fear and peace, sorry. In reaction to the fear felt by lost seamen, it reacts through the creation of place of placidity beneath the furious surface. In this place, the speaker once more states in land in which peaceful sleep is always possible. There are no bad dreams or fears to rouse those young and fair and we lost to the water. Next work is, oh, could I raise the darkened wheel? Here, this is a short 12 stanza poem that follows a consistency alternating rhyming scheme. The line follows a pattern of A, B, A, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, F, F. The poem is named for its first line. Oh, could I, ri could I raise the darkened wheel? This was a popular practice in 19th century and continued to this day. The choice to not select an independent title lets the poem stand on its own terms, without an initial phrase, separate from the poetic narrative to set the tone. Oh, could I raise the darkened wheel by Nathaniel Hawthorne? Describes what it would be like to see into the future and then forget and then regret having looked. 
The poem begins with the sparkling wondering aloud what he would do if he had the chance to see into fate's mysterious book. He is curious what he would see if was if he was able to raise the wheel that separates the word from the future and take a look into the unborn ages that will come after him and the days of his life he is yet to live while this prospect might be tempting at first he knows that the that he would regret having looked if it ever come to that came to that he would not dare to look past uh, his own time for any reason at all the second half of the poem is spent in flushing out the reasoning behind the choice behind this choice the speaker knows that if he looked into the future there is a chance that he will not like what he sees he could find himself looking at poverty and unending grief that lies in wait for him if this was the case he knows himself well enough to predict that he would not be driven to suicide in an attempt to avoid such a fate the speaker concludes by stating once more that no matter how tempting it might be he would never want to know his own future he will not look behind the wheel or in the fixed book of fate the second part of the poem is made up of speaker's reasoning to many his choice might seem short sighted cowardly or wasteful but he is able to fully articulate and pronounce a convincing argument to the contrary he describes the possible sights from the future he might see laid out before him there could be the specter of poverty and grief and does not know what the result of seeing such a sight would be but it is likely that dark despair would take a hold on him despair is capitalized in an attempt to imbue the force with a consciousness and independent power it is very possible the speaker will be overcome with speaker will overcome with despair for a future that does not exist yet and seeking the lonely tomb too early he is worried the sight of a poor future would drive him to depression and suicide in an effort to escape earthly gloom and seek endless gloom a world in which he is slipping away from any possible future and happiness might tempt him depending on what he saw he knows all these facts about himself so he refuses now if he ever gets a chance in the future to cast a look the speaker strongly states that fate's fixed or unchanging mysterious book will never be known to him let's move ahead now we are going to read twice told tales let's see the publication date twice told tales it's a short story collection in two volumes by nathaniel hawthorne the first was published in the spring of 1837 and the second in 1842 and the publisher was american stationer.com dot co let's see the introduction of the story dr Dr. Hedegger invites a group of distinguished Gates guests to his place to participate in an experiment. This Hawthorne classic tells the tale of Reverend Hooper, who shocks his congregation by appearing before them in a black veil that obscures his face. The story. The story set in Boston in 
the late 1960s in the late 1600 century starts with the people expressing their unrest and distrust of their colonial government governor sorry the scene is tense this ironic story starts with a traveler who has found shelter for the night with a family who live who lives next to a mountain this hawthorne classic tells the tale reverend hooper who shocks his congregation by appearing before him in the black veil that obscure his face he delivers a sermon on secret sin then presides over the funeral of a young woman he expanded edition the expanded edition may contain 39 stories but not all of them are still widely read despite their age some of these stories will regularly make high school and college reading lists dr hedegor invites a group of distinguished guests to place to participate in an experiment he shows them a vase full of water from the legendary fountain of youth and to prove that it's real he regenerates a witness a withered rose before their eyes the elderly guests drink and transform becoming young and beautiful the three men then fight over the affection of the one woman break the vase and within minutes transform back to their old selves dr hedegor's experiment is complete and he has revealed a true truth about human nature word spreads around town about the minister's wheel and his own fiance elizabeth directly confronts him about it he refuses to take it off even for her and not long after the incident she breaks off their engagement while his personal life suffers his professional life blooms as his veiled appearance lends power to the sermons on his deathbed still wearing his black veil he tells all those around him that they were their own wheels the story ends with hooper being buried in his veil now we will read the scarlet letter very important work of nathaniel the scarlet letter novel by nathaniel hawthorne published in 1850 it is considered a masterpiece of american literature and a classic moral study it was published by tickner and fields the theme here is um criticism of puritan beliefs regarding sin individuality society social norms and sense of guilt here what is sin okay which is defined by puritans are being questioned here individual and society what are the desires of individual person and what is the requirement of a society there is a mismatch okay and people are you know they are under social norms but still there are rules and regulations which they break and there is a sense of guilt in them okay so entire story revolves around all these topics here the characters are arthur dimesdale then roger chillingworth and then paul okay arthur is lover of hester prime and Roger Killingworth is husband of Hester Prime then Pearl is daughter of Hester Prime here Hester Prime is chief character in the novel the novel is set in a village in puritan new england the main character is Hester Prime a young woman who has born a chill out of wedlock Hester believes herself a widow but her husband Roger Chillingworth arrives in New England very much alive and 
conceals his identity. He finds his wife forced to wear the scarlet letter A on her dress as punishment for her adultery. Friends, keep in mind, okay, this letter A and on whom? On Hester Prime. Okay, for what? For adultery. Adultery means having affair with, having illegal affair with another man. Okay, especially two women. After Hester refuses to name her lover, Killingworth becomes obsessed with finding his identity. When he learns that the man in question is Arthur Dimesdale, a, a saintly young minister who is the leader of those exhorting her to name the child's father, Chillington proceeds to torment him. Stricken by guilt, Dimesdale becomes increasingly ill. Hester himself, Hester herself is revealed to be a self-reliant heroine who is never truly repellent for committing adultery with the minister. She feels that their act was consecrated by their deep love for each other. Although she is initially scorned over time for compassion and dignity, silence many of her critics. Friends, the topics which I have not discussed in elaborated manner, I am going to take up those topics in my next video class. So, till then, if you require anything, just drop a message to us. We will certainly complete that as soon as possible. Thank you, friends. And all the best for your examination.